Jackson. I am the founder and executive director of Hagadot.com. And I am so happy to be joined uh, by Rebecca Missel, who, uh, uh, Rebecca, come say, say, unmute yourself and say hello. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here this afternoon. I'm going to keep letting folks in as Eileen takes it away. Great. So we have a bunch to talk about today. So um, I'm really happy to see all of you. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and get right into it. We're going to have uh, some time for presentation and then some time for uh, asking questions and brainstorming together. All right, give me a thumbs up. Can you share? Can you see my screen? Great. So welcome to breaking the Seder rules. Uh, I am really excited about this session uh, because also I wanted to talk about what we see as the rules for our Seders anyway. And hold on just one minute. You know, I want to make sure that I'm also recording this. Uh, we're good? Okay, because I know we have a lot of people who are going to watch this later. Okay, yep. so welcome to uh, Breaking the Seder Rules with Hagadot.com. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Hagadot.com invites every Jew, regardless of their background, to find a place for themselves in the Passover story so that they may create more meaningful, more personal, and more connective uh, Seder. Eileen, I don't think we're on the right screen. I think we have, to, I don't think we're seeing your presentation screen. Oh, how about now? No, I would stop share and then reshare. Okay. See, even we have technical issues sometimes. That's why we tag team. <laughs> yeah, that is why we tag team. Always hey. have your, always have your, um, your webinar wing woman or wing man or wing person. Okay, so Hagenot.com invites every Jew, regardless of their background, to find a place for themselves in the Passover story. We basically want your staters to be really meaningful and really personal so that you're not sitting around being like, who came up with this stuff and why am I doing it? And we have a website uh, called Hagadot.com, obviously, where you can make your own Haggadah by mixing and matching from many uh, different contributors from around the world. You can print out your Haggadah, or if you're doing a Zoom Seder, you can view it uh, an interactive Haggadah online, and it looks like this. Um, and in this Haggadah, you can also have uh, videos and music and even uh, animated GIFs or GIFs. And Haggadot.com is a project of our larger organization called Custom and Craft Jewish Rituals. And we are a design lab for the Jewish community, experimenting with technology, media, and video to imagine new formats for engaging with ancient traditions. And we are a 501c3, and we rely 100% on uh, donations from our users. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that again at the end. But basically, we are entirely funded by people like you. We're like public radio. Uh, we provide this free service, but it's not actually free. It does cost us some uh, a lot to put uh, forward. And so we're hoping that you can help contribute to offset our costs. So let's talk about uh, breaking the rules. We're gonna first start with what are the rules anyway? And rules are in quotation marks because I think the rules are really depending on your perspective. Um, I believe that we can all be rule breakers with intention. We'll have some time for ideas and brainstorming. We've got a ton of ideas from Hagadot.com to share and we'll have time for questions. So my background is actually in uh, graphic design. I went to art school and in art school, they teach you to know the rules so that you could break them effectively, right? We're not just trying to create uh, chaos and subvert everything. The point is to, to know what you're doing. And um, with Hagadot.com, we enable you all to be designers. So uh, welcome to our mini design session. And uh, we're all designers and rule breakers here. So what are the rules? Okay, so we have this Passover Seder, but and there's a lot of rituals that we do, but where do these rules actually come from? So the mitzvot or the laws as we know them that are in the Torah um, uh, are really just like two, maybe three laws. So basically at Passover, there's seven different mitzvot that you should be fulfilling. And um, whether you do fulfill them or not is entirely 
uh, your decision. I'm not here to say uh, how you do your Judaism. Okay, so the two mitzvot in the Torah are that we will tell the Exodus story at Passover as though you personally came out of Egypt, right? Which I think makes sense because we all have our journeys of going from uh, a narrow place to a place of more openness. And we should empathize with the stories of those who have been enslaved or oppressed in some way. So great rule. Um, and then eating matzah, right? Matzah being uh, the flour and water, no yeast, the bread that couldn't rise. Um, and to me, it really is the bread of oppression. Um, it's not my favorite. Okay, but there's also this, all of this is coming from Exodus. And um, there's also this text that tells us, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, basically you're also supposed to, in a hurry, scarf down an entire roasted lamb with your neighbors while wearing sandals and carrying a staff. Uh, don't have any leftovers. If you do have leftovers, burn them. Uh, white blood across your doorpost, obviously, so the angel of death knows that your family is not, uh, you know, we shouldn't be killing the firstborn. Uh, you're not supposed to work on the first and last day of the holiday. Um, and if you eat chametz during the week of Passover, you're essentially cut off from like the entire nation of Israel. And I have a confession here. Um, I have definitely uh, broken Passover more often than not. Uh, even though I'm the creator of this website that loves Passover, I just, I cheat all the time. So really theoretically, according to the Torah, I should be cut off from all of you. Um, sorry, mom and dad who are also on this call. Um, and, you know, so you can look up this text. Uh, Exodus says you should observe this as an institution for all time. Some might say the part about the lamb and like, you know, wiping the blood about your door of, of, on your doorpost is actually now symbolized by the shank bone or like we eat matzah instead of the full lamb. But I don't know, I say go check out the rules in Exodus uh, for yourself and then decide if you've already been a rule breaker. Okay, so then there is the Passover uh, mitzvot and the Seder as we know it, which was developed by the rabbis in the 10th, 11th century. And um, they added a few other uh, details. So we eat maror, which is the bitter herb. You eat the afikomen, as, which is the uh, matzah, as a dessert, essentially, right? Technically, you're supposed to have that matzah be the last thing that you eat, according to the rabbis. Again, I have broken that rule. I like the flourless chocolate cake. I do not go for the matzah after that. Okay, then you're supposed to say Hallel and songs, uh, psalms of praise. Again, I confess, I grew up reform. Uh, we kind of skipped that part and I am totally uh, fine with that. Uh, drinking four cups of wine, I do not skip that part. Um, demonstrating acts of freedom and aristocracy. So this I really like, where, you know, the part where you're supposed to lean, uh, sit with a pillow or a cushion, um, you know, begin the meal with dipping, because dipping was something that only like really kind of hoity-toity people did. Um, but uh, other than that, like there's not a lot that's like really commanded by God as the rules. And if, if that's, you know, who you're trying to be accountable to. Um, but you could read more. I actually uh, pulled this from Aish uh, HaTorah, which is, you know, a more uh, traditional Orthodox website. Um, my sense is when, you know, rabbis are awesome. They like to think about all the rules and all the loopholes, and they want to give us more opportunity to experience the mitzvot, uh, the good deeds uh, for ourselves. But my personal opinion is that it starts to get a little OCD. Again, I am reform secular. Um, but like one thing is that they added is that you should stay up all night talking about the exodus until sleep overtakes you. Um, I go to bed at 10 o'clock. So that's really not all night for me. Um, but anyway, the rabbis themselves are kind of like taking some creative liberties, like extending what the initial purpose of the holiday was, and then creating this bigger structure for us to follow. And yes, the Seder has 15 steps, but there's really still, even if you follow it at all, there's only seven things that you actually have to have to do. Okay, so obviously we're not all concerned with just the Torah and what the rabbis are saying. A lot of us develop rules based on our family and community customs, 
Um, and I'm curious, feel free to put in the chat, what are some of the customs in your family that almost feel like rules? Like, I know uh, my mom changed the plates a lot uh, just because it, it was a, you know, we have special Passover dishes that we used. We didn't clean for hummates. There was no feather and a candle, but like it was just a tradition that we had Passover dishes. Um, you know, is there a special kiddish cup that you use? Is there a special song that you, that you sing? Um, quite honestly, are there family traditions that you're ready to let go of? Um, you know, maybe now that you're not having the big, big family Seder this year, do you feel less pressure? Um, so the rules that I think are really important here are, what do you need from the rituals of Passover? What makes you feel connected with, you know, your values, whether they're Jewish values or not Jewish values? Um, what makes you feel connected with your family and your community, with nature, and, and with something bigger? Um, you know, and that, that could be uh, what you see as a definition of God, or it could just be like the big sense of humanity and peoplehood. You know, what gives you comfort? Um, and you can probably already uh, tell by the way I'm talking, I don't believe in good and bad Jews, right? There's a lot of rules that we can choose to adapt to live our lives. Um, but the fact is you're all Jewish to me if you say you're, you're Jewish. And what's important is do you feel a sense of comfort and strength from your Jewishness or do you get that strength and comfort elsewhere? Uh, either way, especially this year when we're dealing with a pandemic, um, don't beat yourself up over it. So uh, you know, don't feel that you have to get certain parts of the Seder right or you're not a real Jew, or you're not a good Jew. Okay, so now that we know the rules generally, and I'm sure after this session, you'll probably spend some more time thinking about, you know, what are the rules in your family that are really important? What are your community customs? Uh, now it's time to talk about being a rule breaker with intention. Um, so, when I say intention, you know, I, I want you to know why you're breaking the rules. Again, knowing the rules, break them effectively. So intention is, gonna, is what is going to make these adaptations meaningful. What customs feel meaningful to you? What feels archaic at this stage, right? Like somewhere somebody decided we don't need to eat a whole lamb and burn the leftovers. Um, set realistic expectations for yourself and others. Uh, focus on your priorities. So this is something I say a lot, um, especially this year um, when we're all exhausted from uh, the pandemic and just everything that's just been happening um, in our lives lately. Think about the one or two things that you really want to get out of this Seder and focus on that. And, you know, respect each other's needs. So Everybody is trying to fill their needs uh, by uh, engaging in this ritual in some way. Ultimately, we want to provide comfort for ourselves, this sense of connection. So respect that other people might make different decisions than you um, because of their needs. Um, and basically, just don't be James Dean and rebel without a cause. Like, you are a rebel with a cause. Okay, so some ideas for breaking the rules at Passover. Again, what's the one thing you want to get out of the Seder? Um, we hear over and over again, especially when there's kids involved, that kids have like Zoom fatigue, especially if they've do, been doing Zoom school. So um, one of our partners, the Jewish Grandparents Network, uh, they developed the 10-minute Dayenu Seder. And um, they did a great version last year. I think they just sent us a new version for this year, which we're going to put on the site. Yeah, um, we should have it ready uh, by the end of the week. Yeah, great. <laughs> So um, basically with the uh, Dianu Seder, you get to you know, say some blessings. Uh, Lee Hendler who wrote it, she did collaborate with a rabbi. So you know, they did think about what are the essential mitzvot of Passover, um, but we're doing it in a amount of time that feels realistic, honestly. Um, we have another Haggadah on the site called the Minimalist Seder. And this too is um, a really simple Seder, like just the basics. But what I love about it is that if you want text references, like if you want to refer to the Torah and uh, the commentary from the rabbis, the Talmud, he has quotes from all of that in there. So you could feel like, okay, I am really being uh, paying attention to traditional 
uh, Jewish wisdom. I'm not breaking the rules, but I'm being realistic in how much time I'm going to spend on this. Um, our friend Rabbi Dan Horowitz, uh, he's now in Miami, but he was the founder of The Well Detroit, and they created the Friend Seder. And that's also like a short, kind of irreverent, lots of pictures, uh, Haggadah. Um, the goal was for um, I really like 20 and 30 somethings to get together with their friends over Passover. Uh, but we found that audiences of all ages really like it. Okay. So another option, you could go really short or you could, you know, play with timing. You can go long, um, you know, like maybe you want to maximize your mitzvot. Maybe you think the rabbis have the right idea. I want to get in all of the good deeds and like Jewish stuff, you know, may maybe this is the only time during the year that I'm doing Jewish. So let's get it all in. Um, one great project last year, a woman named Kelly Kobe Cohen, she did a Seder all day. So she had two young children and like every hour of the day, they would do a different activity related to the Seder. So, you know, they spent the morning like burning hummates, you know, searching for hummates with the feather. Um, they made uh, smoothies uh, for their kiddish. And I think they talked about like the grapes and, and the berries and, and gratitude for that. Um, they made matzah, which if you haven't done before, I was shocked. It's really easy. It literally is flour and water and you, you could stick it on a griddle. And, um, you know, it, it's pretty tasty. Um, they watched some uh, Passover cartoons. So, um, you know, like, you don't necessarily have to do the whole Seder, but one approach to doing Passover with your family, especially if you're distant, is thinking about, okay, maybe we talk in the morning on Zoom and we do like this little bit of the, the custom, and then we're able to do a drive-by later where we, from our, you know, we can wave at you from your driveway if you haven't been vaccinated yet, and uh, you come back home in the evening and then do another section on Zoom. Um, or there could be things that you, you gather together for on Zoom, and then maybe you do some stuff independently at home, in your own home or in your own pods. Um, the Moisha House also did a really, Moisha House London actually, they did a reverse Seder, which is basically like telling the Passover story, doing the Seder steps um, backwards. And if you're not concerned with eating that Afi Komen last, which I'm certainly not, uh, this also is a, you know, a full Seder following all the mitzvot. Um, I don't know. I think there's something interesting about it because like last year we went into, uh, kind of, a lot of us had been home for, for much of the past year. And like last year we almost went into what we're thinking of as our like narrow place. And we're hoping to later this year after Passover, get out of the, na the narrow place. So I don't know, I think there's something to, about like reversing some of the things that we did last year. Um, if you're still thinking about things like locally or even with your uh, community, you know, what if you had drive through Seder stops or if you had like a Seder walking tour around the neighborhood or, um, you know, just different ways that you could actually like, you know, experience the Exodus as though you personally came out of Egypt by walking around your neighborhood. Okay, so um, other ideas for rule breakers and like we just have so much on Haggadot.com and so um, a lot of the after this we're going to just kind of help troubleshoot some ideas or issues that you're having with planning your Seder. Um, so there is no reason why a Passover Seder can't be fun and I actually think that you're really doing yourselves a disservice if your Seder is not fun, especially this year. Um, there are a few Seder escape rooms that have been circulating online. Um, we're going to try to share a few of those next week. Um, we have, uh, Rebecca just shared it, a great uh, blog post with different ideas for playing games on Zoom or at your Seder. Um, we also have different ideas for the Afi Komen hunt, which obviously is not going to happen the way it would have happened a few years ago where you would have hit it in your house. Um, but you could play 20 questions to get people to guess where that Afi Komen might be in the world. 
Um, we have seen a lot of interest in all of our comedy content this year. I think people just really want to lighten the mood. So we have a comedy Seder on Hagado.com, um, which is actually probably more than you would need for your whole Seder. It's got extra. I mean, I think you download this and you've probably got enough comedy content for the next few years. Eileen, can I just yeah. hop in real quick? Uh, just to let folks know, I'm sharing links in the chat, but all these links will be shared uh, either in the email that you get with the recording and or on our website where the recording will be posted. So if you're not catching all the links and everything, don't worry, we're gonna share those with you. Yeah, thanks Rebecca. Yeah, we are kind of, uh, we're giving you a lot of information here. And so there will be follow-up. Um, if you haven't, uh, when you signed up for this webinar, um, we have your email address. So we're gonna send you follow-up afterwards. If for some reason, we don't have your email address, put it in the chat and Rebecca will add you to our mailing list. So uh, we've got that comedy Seder. We've got a lot of song parodies. Um, I think we've got like, we've got dozens of different songs um, that we can uh, share. Uh, there are a lot of skits, um, lots of skits. And that is something that we've heard from uh, our community that goes really well at the Seder because it's interactive, especially with kids or quite honestly, like grown up kids, like everybody can play a role and get into it. And you are again, fulfilling the rule of, um, you know, seeing yourself as though you personally came out of Egypt. Um, I know this is supposed to be about rule breaking, but the truth is it's actually really easy to follow the rules as long as you're having fun with it. Um, there are pre-recorded elements like video and music that you can add to your Seder. Um, you can search for that on hagadot.com and you can, um, as I showed before with our interactive version, you could play those videos during your Seder if you're using technology. Um, why not have a talent show at your Seder? Why not make it a theme night? Um, I think I've dressed up like twice this year. One of them was for New Year's Eve and like the other one was a costume night. Maybe it's a, a black tie Seder just to, you know, see if I can still fit into some dresses. Um, you know, feel free to move during your Seder. So uh, normally we're at a table and uh, you don't have a lot of space to get up and maybe do a little bit of yoga or just, you know, even if you're sitting, just like stretch your arms out. Um, there is a great activity on our site and we'll send the link and follow up. There's a, the Silver Lake JCC in Los Angeles, they do an activity called the human tableau. And during the Magid section, the, the telling of the Exodus story, uh, they have different groups get up and, uh, enact a, a, you're kind of creating a, a tableau, which is basically like a still image of a scene in the Passover story. Um, and that would work really well on Zoom, even with families, you know, separated in different places. Uh, we have done a ton with alternative Seder plates. Um, I, again, I am not going to police you if you replace the Seder plate entirely. Um, if you don't do the maror, technically you are a rule breaker, but you're still Jewish to me. Um, and uh, yeah, last year we had a lot of people coming up with interesting alternative symbols for the Seder plate because they just couldn't get everything that they normally would get. Remember, we were, we were rushed into a lockdown with just a few weeks before Passover. Um, you know, I think it would be fun to do a Seder in bed. Like we're supposed to be reclining. A bed is the ultimate place to rec recline. Um, you know, think about how you could use this super weird time that we're still in to do things that you wouldn't do uh, when hopefully we go back to our, our normal lives. Um, you know, also the, the sipping Seder, you can make different cocktails for your Seder, a horseradish cocktail, uh, a parsley cocktail, a beetroot cocktail. Um, and I've even had a rabbi uh, suggest to her congregation to do a wine tasting for Passover with four different uh, wines. And you can do that this year. You can think ahead of time, like what are the wines that we get? And then you just, uh, everybody who's attending your Seder gets, uh, orders them. And then, you know, you're having the shared experience, uh, you know, with your food even, oh yeah. And using bitters is also a great idea. Um, so yeah, there's still so much that you can do. Okay, we share this every time. Um, I'm a big fan of gallery view on Zoom. I'm sure Zoom is not so new to you anymore, but like 
you know, remember that you can still like welcome guests as they arrive um, and like use, think about how you want to use that chat space um, where people are kind of, there's a little bit of downtime, but people are still sort of welcoming each other. On Haggadot.com, you can invite uh, your Seder guests to collaborate on your Haggadah. And so you can invite your entire family or whoever you're doing Seder with to be rule breakers too. I mean, like your whole goal could be like, let's break the Seder this year. Like let's, let's understand what we're supposed to get out of the Seder, but like this year has been hard enough. I am going to, I'm going to subvert the Seder with intention. Um, and, you know, just remember, like, uh, you can still think about your lighting. When I do these webinars, I always have a lamp near me so that you can see me a little bit better. Um, I love to see everyone in my family, so I want to make sure that they are in good lighting and I'm not shy to ask them to move where they're sitting so that they have, so I can see their full faces. Um, you know, we can still, like, have fun, e even though that, even though Zoom is something that we are tired of, uh, hopefully this is, you know, we're getting close to the last moments where we're going to have to do this. Um, just some quick resources before we open it up for conversation. Um, obviously, Haggadot.com, this is where you can find all of this content. You can make your own Haggadah or not. We have plenty of just compilations for you to download. And actually what's new this year is that um, a lot of our featured Haggadahs are now templates. So like before, we only had a secular, a liberal, and a traditional template. Um, but starting later this week, if you want to use the Jubilong template as your, your Jubilong Haggadah as your template, you could start from that. You could start with the comedy Haggadah. So it's going to make it easier for you to mix and match. Um, we love Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, uh, what, How We Meet and Why It Matters. I think it's really helpful even for these weird times. Um, we do have a Facebook group, Haggadot.com Seder Planners. So find that group, request uh, um, access, and we'll let you in. And people are sharing their own tips for making Passover. Um, we do have a women's Seder template. Uh, we've got a couple, actually. And uh, for those of you who uh, haven't been to a women's Seder before or don't know much about it, there is a tradition of doing women's Seders. I think it's on the seventh night or eighth night. Um, and that's because... Uh, I think, is that uh, with respect to Miriam? Rebecca, do you know more about this? Um, the, the tradition I know around seventh and eighth night seders is around Mimuna, not around, uh, oh, okay. which is a, a Sephardi Mizrahi custom. I don't, I haven't heard, but I like it. I, yeah. I'm sure I could argue it. Pro yeah, I don't know, but sure. Yeah. Um, so different nights for the women's Seder or do your women's Seder as your first night Seder. Um, Mimuna, which Rebecca was referring to, is really great. It's like uh, also a celebration of being able to eat bread again, um, which we all love. Um, I also want to share on Thursday, we're going to be doing a, I'm going to have a conversation with Mark Gerson, who has a podcast called The Rabbi's Husband. And he is the author of the new book called The Telling. And um, it's got a lot of great wisdom for uh, Passover and learning facts and, you know, um, just even all of that stuff that I shared in the beginning about Exodus. He has a lot of really interesting details on that. Um, and then Mark has really generously offered that for anyone who donates $54 or more to Haggadot.com through Passover, um, he's going to send you a free hardcover book. Um, I had to like double check that because I, I couldn't believe that they would send a hardcover book as opposed to an ebook. But yes, you will get a hardcover book. So um, yeah, that's a great partnership we've got going. And again, make sure that you're in our newsletter. We have your email address and we're going to keep sharing more tips as we go along. So um, with that, I want to stop sharing my screen and just have a conversation about, you know, what are the challenges we're facing here? What are the rules that we're thinking about breaking? And how can I help you break some rules? You can put questions into the chat or uh, hop off mute, whichever you prefer. But usually chat's a little bit easier. I'm also curious if anybody has a good Seder inspired uh, cocktail. So I will tell you one that we made a couple years ago, purely by accident, 
we made what we called um, a sabra kilo. So <laughs> we, uh, we had uh, tequila and sabra and we weren't sure what to do with them. And we decided to just mix them together. And I can tell you it's delicious. Uh, add a little bit of sparkling water. You might want to uh, lighten it up a little bit because it can be quite strong. Maybe a twist of lime. Um, it's really good. Oh, great question about sort of a, uh... A, a sort of multi-dimensional Seder that includes both the coloring book Haggadah, which is another great fun Haggadah that I can uh, put in the chat in just one second. So how do you sort of do a short service for the older kids and adults and then shift into that? I think that there's a lot of great, first of all, the coloring book Haggadah is technically a complete Haggadah. Uh, so you can use that as your base and then either make some pit stops along the way to uh, have stuff for older for older kids and adults, or you could just have the kids sort of playing at you know the proverbial kids table, whether that's a virtual or in person table, that they can come in and out of while the rest of the family is doing a, a more traditional seder. I'll share the coloring book and maybe and our our family favorites, uh, and then yeah, Marjorie Margie asked about Passover TikToks. I admit I am not an active TikTok user. I guarantee you, if you go on to TikTok and you just search Passover, you'll find something. I, I, if sea shanties were a thing on TikTok, Passover definitely is. Um, yeah, or you might even want to think about like certain songs related to liberation. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, you know, we could, sh we could uh, share a Passover playlist with you and uh, then you could start looking up those songs on TikTok. I see a hand. You, Wendy, yeah, you have your hand raised. Sorry, I was muted. One year, am I echoing? No, you're good. you're good. Okay, sorry, I have two devices on. Um, one year we did a sing down at the end of the Seder, divided into teams. And each group had to come up with songs that had the word free or freedom in them. And it was a lot of fun. That's a great idea. Um, you know, I also just quickly want to go back to the idea of the coloring book Haggadah. Um, I'm not sure if we totally answered it. So I think with whenever there's kids involved, I think you got to like hype them up or pump them up for the experience ahead of time, right? So you, you figure out what parts of the Seder they're going to join in on. Maybe they can make it through all the blessings and you do a kind of rush through the main blessings, or maybe they're only there for the four questions and Dayenu. But I think like a couple weeks ahead of time, you got to say like, oh, I'm so excited for you to read the four questions during the Seder so that they know, you know, they're, that's, that's something you're expecting out of them. Um, but I think what's great about the coloring book Haggadah is that you can use it for the blessings and then the kids can just color while the adults continue with um, other other Seder content. And honestly, I, th I think that a lot of the adults are coloring too. Um, you know, it could be a nice way to get together casually and maybe like color while you're doing the Seder and uh, you could even share some original drawings afterwards. Uh, Anita had a question and then I wanna touch on uh, after Anita's question, what David's question is in the chat about bringing together those who are assimilated and uh, for people for whom Passover is meaningful, because I think there actually can be the same people, but I'll let Anita go first. Well, I was going to say something along those lines um, in that I think the well, let me, my first comment was, um, somebody had a question about the four questions. And my challenge, we usually do an entire Seder. It's fairly long. It's irreverent. We have a great time with it. Um, one year we did a Jeopardy um, Seder where you can go to a Jeopardy website and put in the answers and just have questions and people could do this either in person or you can do this, you know, virtual. And that was a lot of fun. Um, I think my, my challenge isn't with the four questions. Every year I, I, am, I struggle with the four children, the four different kinds of, of, of children, because I think those are the, that's the thing that I've struggled with ever since I was a kid, that, that I didn't like those characterizations. So that's what I'm always looking for, a re, 
infusing that structure with something that's more meaningful, um, which leads me to the comment that David had, which is, I don't think they're two different kinds of people for whom it's meaningful and for whom it's assimilated. I think it's a matter of taking the structure and infusing it with something that is meaningful to anybody and everybody. And I don't think it's a matter of assimilation. I think it's just a function of how you reimagine the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think those are great ideas, and I, and I think regarding the four children or the four sons, uh, yeah, I kind of the original story of that I kind of hate, but I love it because it gives us this template, like this the this uh, these four archetypes that we can learn from. I don't think wise, simple, wicked, and the one who doesn't know how to ask. I, I don't think that that hits the mark. But I do think that we're hitting, um, you know, there are diff a lot of different ways that we come at tradition and customs and the Passover Seder. There's a lot of different ways that we identify with Judaism, like, you know, more, more ways than we could even imagine. And, and Jews, we love to disagree with each other, but maybe this is an opportunity with these four children to empathize with all of the different ways that people um, approach uh, this, our tradition and the different yeah. needs that people have, right? Like we really don't have the option to go say like, you know, this child is the one that, uh, that's right. You, you have to work with all of them. I shared a few links okay. in the chat, uh, just real quick about the four children that came from a couple of our contributors. Uh, the Blue Dove Foundation put something together through a mental health perspective, which I think is really great. Uh, particularly as we're all sort of carrying so much this year. And then, uh, thank you, Esther. And then uh, our friends at uh, Reform Judaism actually posted like a few different articles ranging from like the Star Wars to the, to the views on Zionism to everything in between uh, using that angle of the four children. Uh, so I think that that's really, uh, really important. And I just, I also just want to echo that I, I agree that that, you know, that I, having been to a lot of seders and myself, uh, my partner isn't Jewish. And I think that having, having a seder that is meaningful to you as a host translates for the rest of the people at your seder, especially when you're all adults. I think if you find it meaningful and you're excited about it, then everybody else will be too. And regardless of, you know, whether or not they're, they're, you know, religious or assimilated or not Jewish, I think, or, or love everything else about Passover. I think your enthusiasm and your, your excitement and attitude really make a difference. Uh, Linda. I was just going to say just one little change is, you know, traditionally the cynical child says, well, what does this mean to you? But we've always looked at it and what does this mean to you? Like, explain to me. And you can, you can stay within some actual framework, but definitely change it because we all have issues with the four children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm curious to know who who is doing a form of hybrid Seder this year where some people will be on Zoom and some people will be in person. And I'm curious if you could share uh, how you're planning to do that because this is this is really brand new. Yeah. We don't know yet, depends on who's vaccinated. Uh, we have no idea. Yeah, we're unsure too. We're trying to figure it out. We usually have 40 people around a table. I said, I'm happy if I can get four at my table that are happy to be together. And the rest on Zoom or six or eight, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, yeah, you had your, yeah. Yeah, um, so, you know, we were forced into it last year. Uh, it was just me and my husband at the table, but I had my daughter in Miami on, uh, on FaceTime and my father uh, in a... Um, in a um, nursing home on an iPad. And we had the two devices on the table because uh, they couldn't get Zoom or a, or a bigger platform on their iPad. So we were picking up the iPad and showing it to the computer, but we got through it. And I had um, a homemade pre hagada.com before I knew about you guys, maybe 15 years ago, I made my own 
uh, Haggadah. And so I just um, copied uh, it and, and sent my uh, daughter a copy of it, you know, and uh, we uh, made do with, you know, my homemade Haggadah and uh, my dad just followed along. So, you know, we did what we could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Renee. <clears throat> so I think we're actually going to look back on this time as the beginning of our future seders because I really welcome the fact that I now can have at my seder table people who in the past I never could have considered. Yeah. So the hybrid model, I think, is I think this is going to be year one of a hybrid model. Um, and I'm anxious to try it out and see um, just how I want to enhance it and going forward. But one of the ways a hybrid model works well uh, for Passover is if in reversing the order of the Seder, you eat first. So if everybody in their homes eat first and then you sit down with the Seder, the Seder becomes less about the food because you're not all together and much more about the conversation and the and the time together either on zoom or in person so we tried that last year it worked really well and um and this year we will continue with that really smart mm -hmm. hanger does not make a good seder i'll just say that just <laughs> Feel free to minimize. I, I grew up in a very uh, crudite focused family during the first part of the Seder, right? There was always, my mom had like this one tray that was always for like olives, pickles, and like carrot sticks, right? And that was like gobbled that up during the, but it, I think it makes a big difference. No, nobody's happy, hangry in a Seder. Uh, but I love the, yeah, eating first. And Wendy's right, right? Because first and second night are on a Saturday and a Sunday this year. It gives us all a little bit more freedom to play with that sense of time. Yeah. Nobody's rushing home from work, hopefully. And yeah, I like that. Deborah, I think you, you had something you wanted to share. I, mean, I was just gonna say we um, last year was the first time we did a uh, you know a Zoom Seder and it was just the two of us here, my husband, myself. And then we were in, there were five different homes. I don't even remember and I had two different nights one, I had a lot of kids um, and great nieces and nephews and grandchildren, and we did kind of the reverse. We did the Seder. Uh, we did the thing. The big thing for us is the grand finale, you know, the songs and all of that part. So um, we decided to do the whole Seder and they'd have their dinner afterwards. And it was up to everybody putting it together. And they said, no, Aunt Debbie, we want to sing the songs with everybody there. So we did the ritualistic kind of thing. I, I've been writing my own Haggadah with Haggadot.com started many, many, many years ago. Um, and uh, we did that. And so it was great fun. And then they went and ate on their own. But I also gave out parts. I, I shared the Haggadah and said, okay, guys, you pick your page that you're reading. You pick your section. They're all, you know, you just tell me or decide among yourselves because I'm not reading the whole thing to you. And that worked. I mean, you know, different families took a page or two. It wasn't that long. Um, but they had some say in it and, you know, having some say is having some ownership. So that helps. That's a so. huge point. Yeah. The, the, having that ownership sense, uh, that's what we talk a lot about, like give everyone a role. Uh, and that could also even be, um, especially if you are going to be a lot of folks on zoom, have giving everybody, assigning everyone a, something to bring with them to have either in the background or to physically have next to them during the Seder I think is great. And it's a great way to get kids involved because it doesn't have to be, you know, a whole huge thing. If you've got, I, I, so I have a cousin who's got a, a two-year-old and a five-year-old and I would be fascinated to ask the both of them, what do you want to bring to your Seder? And I would just love to see what they decide to bring. Like, I think it's such a fun way to get them, to get them engaged too. Um, I, I'm a, a widow and I have been hosting in my home seders for 30 to 40 people for years, doing most of the cooking and also leading it. Um, so last year, what I couldn't st and stand like not doing some of the food. So I made chicken soup and matzo balls and brisket, dividing it in smaller family portions so I had five of the normal participating families come stop by my garage, pick up their food. So we had a five minute visit from 12 feet away. And so it at least gave 
both sides a sense that we were sharing in some weird way the meal. And then I led the Seder on Zoom. I had, I have made some Haggadot in the past, spiral bound, and I had mailed them out to people. So everyone had the same thing in front of them. Um, and then I had spoken to different people about doing stuff, but I'm tempted this year um, to maybe just do the coloring book Seder for everybody and incorporate um, having some people expound maybe on certain parts of it or I like the idea of bring that, um, you know, bringing something. So, I mean, a little kid can bring something, have something with them. And I don't care whether it's relevant to the story or not, if they feel this is what they want to share. I love that idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, so for those of you who weren't in our last uh, webinar, Rebecca shared some great ideas about uh, bringing personal objects too to the Seder. And, um, you know, as we talk about, um, as we talk about alternative Seder plate items, uh, really everybody could bring something to the Seder table. That's, a, that's an object of meaning, whether it represents the past year or Passover to them, or just an opportunity to, to share. Uh, I mean, I think we all really loved show and tell when we were growing up, and I don't think that ever went away. Any other questions while we're while we're here? Um, I, I pull them up. Yeah, great idea, Seder in a box. That's also great. I've also asked people to bring their own four questions. Mm -hmm. ah. You know, 20th yeah. century, you're sitting here in, uh, you know, in this world, what are your questions about the world we're going to have next? What's, what's going on in your mind? Because some of the things are a little different. Um, mm -hmm. And if they can't I like that. Bring four, I they, like that they add one, you know, somebody adds one and goes along the way and you say, what's next? So. I like yeah. that. And that's really, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be uh, one of the meets vote that I've talked about, but it seems like asking questions is really the point of the Seder and being <laughs> curious and looking at our own history and our own, you know, our, our Jewish histories, our family histories. Um, you know, another thing that you can do is just like use this as an opportunity to talk, tell family stories or share family history that you haven't done before. You know, we, uh, because, you know, it's the sort of thing that you'll always think you'll pass on and, and tell your children, but, uh, you know, it's not always the top of mind. And so what are some things that you, you want to share this year that you, you haven't had an opportunity to share before? I, I just will share one other thing that I don't mean to do too much, but I did ask last year, what did they remember? I asked the little kids, what do you remember? Because it was the first time they weren't in my house for Seda. And interestingly enough, it's either the songs or something we ate. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's not, it's not even the four. And, and I had one year, I had the Red Sea as my tablecloth and the party and, you know, and the, I've done lots of things, but it's very interesting that it's the musical parts that they remember. Or, and those are the sensual pieces. I mean, mm -hmm. the songs that it's the senses that you awaken that keep your memories. Exactly. Yeah. Bringing in those five senses, even though we're still, a lot of us are going to be in front of a screen. You know, that's, that's what's so great about the Passover Seder, like the, with the foods that we eat and the songs that we sing. Um, think of, spend some time thinking about, you know, what you miss of Seders in the past and think about how you can get a little bit of that this year. And and ask your family and your guests the same thing so that we're able to learn more about each other and make sure that everybody feels satisfied. One of the things we've done for years, and this was when people were in person, but it can be definitely done with our friend, the chat room, was I used to, um, I used to ask people before that we started to go around and, and um, tell us what they're bringing with them on their journey this year. What, not not what would you take with you if you were leaving Egypt, but 
what are you bringing with you now to for this for this for your journey that's upcoming um and that was really interesting and then um I don't know how we'll ever get to do this without being in person, but I had bought a whole bunch of little stones and people kind of went around and I would hand the stone to you and tell you, this is my gift to you for your journey. Mm. And go around. This was all without little kids. So, <laughs> but, but um, I did that a lot with the women's satyrs that I ran. Um, there's ways of doing that with the chat room. It's a nice way to start and put a framework on the Seder as, as starting a journey out of the Narrows because we've been in the Narrows for so long. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, depending on how many people you have coming to your Seder, like we've learned a lot from educators who use our, our website. They use this website called Mentimeter. Um, Rebecca, could you put that in the chat? It's, yeah. uh, or it's uh, basically you can create polls uh, and, and, or ask questions and those questions will, people can chat their answers and they'll pop up on screen in like a visual format. Um, I realized I could type it too. No, I've got it. I've got it. I just oh, wanted right. to double check. I had um, it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Great idea. Esther made a, a FaceTime appointment with your nieces to make her roast it. Yeah. Like very cool. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting also like science experiments that you could do related to the Seder. Um, you know, even just like matzah, like at what point does, does, do flour and water create matzah or are they just paper mache paste? Um, I do a lot of paper mache. So I've been thinking about that a lot. <laughs> um, any last questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, all of this is, uh, all of this information is going to be on our uh, blog. We're gonna send you this recording. We're gonna send you a list of these links. Um, I just wanna say again, we are uh, entirely supported by user donations. So a lot of uh, Jewish organizations, they have big funders who, uh, a, a, you know, a foundation or a big donor who might give them tens of thousands of dollars to run their operation. Um, I'm only able to pay our team, Rebecca, our developers who do all this work and everybody who's hard at work this year making this available for you. I'm only, we're only able to make this possible uh, with the support of users. And um, the more that you support us, uh, the more that we're able to do. And of course, I understand that not every year we have a little extra money and we know that this year has been hard. Um, so if not this year, get us next year, but um, I have to ask. So. Um, Rebecca shared the link. And with that, we are going to, I want to really thank you all for being here. This was a great session. Um, you've all been, you know, such a great group. Um, Rebecca and I have a little ritual that we like to close out with. We started it last year. We're doing it again. And we like to put our hands in the middle and just like we were at, like, you know, a sports team, which uh, I never played any sports, uh, <laughs> but just like we were about to play a softball ball. game, uh, we could all put our, on the count of three, we're going to raise our hands up and yell Seder and, uh, and we'll, we'll wave goodbye from there. Okay, so hands in, one, two, three, Seder. <laughs> all right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, well done.